Uh, Psych 291, uh, Introduction to Counseling, and this is the first lecture. Uh, <laughs> if you've looked at the other lecture, you're going, wait a minute, this isn't 2021. No, this is 2022. Uh, so let me talk about uh, how we're going to do this class. Uh, there we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, this is the syllabus. Yeah, fall 2022. Um, I I'm not in in Sela. I think somebody pronounced it that way the other day. I'm in Lost Nation, Iowa. Um, I'm teaching online, of course. Um, this is my telephone number. Uh, you can get a hold of me anytime, I guess. Uh, I don't always have my cell phone with me. I'm not a technophile, so that's the way things work. I'm going to have office hours uh, uh, four days a week, um, Monday and Tuesday from 3 to 5, your time, and on Wednesday and Thursday, 8 to 10, your time, of course. Uh, we're an hour ahead because we are central, central time, not important. Uh, so two hours a day, uh, you can get a hold of me, and I will be here. And uh, it's the same for all of the... All of my classes, this is my Zoom address, I've decided not to change it every, or, or make uh, uh, make appointments, uh, but if you need to get a hold of me, and it is some other time, you can't, uh, you can't meet uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday at these times, I'll be glad uh, to, to go to the Zoom site, and, uh, and uh, we can have a meeting anytime. Um, this is a counseling class, and because we are remote, because we are online, uh, that's the way we're going to teach the class. Uh, one of the things that is happening in the world today is not just the, the uh, coronavirus pandemic uh, and the monkeypox, uh, which looks like the chicken pox, uh, but it's there's also there's another virus out there. And, and of course, you know, we're humans. Uh, we, we live uh, in a world with other creatures, and sometimes those creatures develop uh, viral infections that uh, mutate and become uh, human uh, pandemics. And this is a possibility for the future. They were, I was just reading an article uh, that there's another virus out there that looks like, uh, that's, that's similar to the flu, uh, but it looks like it... Uh, may take off uh, in, in the next year year or so. Uh, they don't think it's going to be as virile uh, as the uh, as the coronavirus that has killed more than a million Americans. Uh, but uh, you know this is always a possibility. And if this is the way, wave of the future that uh, people have to wear masks and they have to stay away from each other uh, more than they are now, uh, then counseling will be an online thing. Uh, online counseling is, is very viable. Uh, all of, you know, counseling is just talking to people, letting people talk to you. Um, this is one of the things we're learning from social media. This is good for people. It's good for people to uh, communicate. And sometimes they need to vent. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, that is the job of the counselor. So, um, that's the way we're going to run this class. Uh, so, and I, I believe, and this is, you know, we could just run this class and, and we could run through the textbook and, and I could tell you how to counsel and then assume that you know what's going on. Uh, but I don't, I think what you need to do is, is find out if, if this is something that you would like to do. Um, so we'll be talking about how, how to do counseling all through the, the semester, of course. But uh, the last five weeks, we're only, we're only going to be in the book for, for 10 weeks. And then the last five weeks will be counseling. Uh, you will counsel each other. Uh, we're not going to counsel you as who you are, but we're going to counsel you as a character that you create. Uh, you need to create a character with, with some kind of a mental health problem. Um, and each of you will be uh, responsible for 10 counseling sessions. Uh, you can do this uh, Zoom, you can do this Duo, you can do this Facebook, um, you can email each other, you can call each other on the on the cell phone. 
Um, let me let me tell you a quick story. I had a colleague once uh, who discovered that uh, that uh, she had a problem and uh, she needed to deal with that problem. It's it's a problem that she'd been uh, bouncing away from for an extended length of time, and she had really never dealt with it. Um, and she, she's a psychologist, and you would think, my goodness gracious, you know, you would just talk to yourself. Uh, it's not the way it works. And uh, she discovered that she needed to get counseling. And so uh, her counselor was in Chicago, and she was in uh, Arizona. So uh, what she did, she would communicate with this with her counselor in Chicago uh, on a on a at least a weekly basis, and if she had any kind of a crisis or any kind of a breakthrough, then she would uh, she would communicate with this this individual, and it worked. Uh, she was uh, in counseling for about eighteen months, and uh, by the time she was done, she she knew what she had to do, and she knew that she needed to change her life. That she had been uh, neglecting herself, and she had been neglecting uh, obvious things that people had tried to tell her from time to time. She was um, uh, a codependent, and uh, and that was her basic problem. And anyway, and it took her eighteen months to to uh, convince herself that uh, this is the this is the direction she needed to take. Uh, she needed to uh, change her relationship with her significant other. And uh, she she needed to fix fix everything. Okay, so uh, let's set ground rules for your character. Um, I, I you, you need to, to create this character uh, a, as soon as possible. I'm going to give you points for creating the character. Uh, there is a uh, I'll show you where there is a uh, no I won't. It's on the uh, website. The Blackboard website. Uh, there is a uh, character history, and you can download that and fill it out. It's a, it's a word document, I believe. Anyway, you can fill it out, and uh, with with a fictitious name, of course. We don't want your name. Uh, we don't want to call you by your own name. That would uh, that that hits too close to home. Uh, so you need to create a new name. You need to to. Select a mental illness that is that you do do not suffer from, and one that you have never had. Um, and the reason you need to do this is because uh, if you have ever had this problem, or if you have it now, uh, then potentially this will create a relapse in you, and we don't certainly don't want that to happen. Um, <clears throat> And actually, that's what happened with uh, with this with my colleague. She was uh, uh, taking a class in counseling. <clears throat> she had never she had never been a, a counseling psychologist before. Uh, she was uh, she was another type of psychologist. She was a research psychologist, and she decided she wanted to go into counseling because she talked to people and, and it really helped them. She gave them good advice. Uh, so she decided she wanted to be a, become a counselor, and she started the program. And she took one class, and the, uh, uh, the her professor told her, "Hey, look, you got too many problems from the past that you haven't dealt with, and you can't cannot do this, or this, or or you'll have a breakdown." Um, and so she started counseling. As and as I said, it took her eighteen months to get over it, or eighteen months to to take care of her problem. <clears throat> so this is this is what I need you to do. I need you to make sure that your character doesn't have the same or similar problems to you. You need to come up with something totally different. Uh, the other thing that you need to do, uh, so you need to write this, uh, uh, create this character and, and write a history out. Uh, the other thing that you need to do is write a paper on your character's problem so that you understand it. Uh, so that you show me that you understand it uh, well enough to act like somebody with that problem. How about that? Okay. All right. So let's talk about how we're going to score everything. Uh, there will be a chapter quiz. Uh, the quizzes are fairly short. They're only about ten questions. Uh, I, uh, ten questions a piece. So, so that'll be 150 points. 
your library paper, the one on your, your character's problem, uh, will be worth 100 points. Uh, there are discussion questions for uh, each 10-week period, um, and that will be worth 100 points. Your fictional biography, strangely enough, is worth uh, 50 points. So once you finish that, people, this is, I, strangely enough, this is what uh, is the hardest part about this class, is coming up with this uh, fictional history. It's only, it's not that, it's not that long. It's, uh, if you've ever uh, filled out a medical form, a medical history form, it's the same thing. I mean, it's the same thing, except you're talking about mental health instead of fictional health. Uh, I'm sorry. Instead of, you're talking about medical health. Mental health instead of medical health. Okay, so fictional biography um, is worth 50 points. And, and uh, I, you know, I can say, oh, this thing is due in September. Uh, we'll start counseling in November. Uh, but the way it normally works out is that uh, people delay this thing. Uh, the other thing I need to tell you is that um, my teaching style is that uh, uh, I accept late work. Uh, I would appreciate it if you get things in on time uh, or in a timely manner. Uh, but the reality is I don't count off for late work. And there's a lot of different reasons why I do that. I think it helps my students because a lot of students... Uh, crisis will come up during the uh, during the semester. It's 15 weeks, uh, so you miss a week or you miss two weeks, or you have to you have to go take care of grandma in uh, in uh, Las Vegas or whatever. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I, I don't count off for late work. Uh, I would appreciate it if you try if you do get things in in a timely manner, but uh, if you turn in your your library paper the day before grades are due, then then I will, will try to grade it. <clears throat> uh, of course, you, you need to get this. You need to get the the counseling sessions done. Um, the last five weeks we're going to be counseling. Uh, that's two counseling sessions a week. Uh, but of course, uh, a counseling session is not just you counseling somebody else. It's also them counseling uh, your character. So, uh, so that's something that you need to think about. Counseling sessions are worth 100 points. Uh, all in all, it's about 500 points. Um, you know, it's not that it's not that hard if you if you keep up with it. The book is a uh, is a good book. Uh, it teaches you how to. Uh, this is primarily this is a fairly generic form of counseling uh, that is used by social workers. It's also used in psychology. This is what I learned. When I was uh, when I was an undergraduate, or not an undergraduate, but a, a master's student in counseling in, uh, back in the 70s, uh, this is what I learned. Uh, it's uh, it's fairly Rogerian. Uh, it's it's seeking strengths and accentuating uh, people's strengths. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's a good way to counsel. It's a good generic way to counsel. If you if you decide, oh, geez, I'd rather. Uh, be a gestaltist or uh, use cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, uh, then fine, you know, but this is a good starting point. And it'll also tell you if you are, uh, can do this counseling thing. Uh, not everybody can. Uh, my colleague uh, was unable to get through the program uh, because of her problems. Uh, so uh, like I said, not everybody can. Sometimes uh, you, people don't like the the biggest the the thing that uh, that I need to tell you now and the thing that you probably need to think about is that uh, counseling isn't giving people advice counseling is letting them talk and they come up with uh, with solutions not you uh, you can come up with solutions uh, but that's not the essence of counseling the essence of counseling is them coming up with their own solutions if they come up with a solution they're more likely to stick with it. If you come up with a solution, eh, there's a huge possibility. It's just like giving somebody advice. Uh, how often do they take it? Uh, what, about 10, 15 percent? Uh, so, so there you go. Okay. All right. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, then you can uh, contact me. <clears throat> um, there's a bunch of you. I think there's 20. Wait a minute. I did this last night. How many people are in the class right now? Uh, 24. Uh, 24 people in the class. So that's a lot of uh, a lot of counseling sessions. 
It's a lot of grading on my part, but that's okay. I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind doing the grading. Uh, okay, let's talk about uh, chapter one. Uh, chapter one deals with uh, the importance of self-understanding, and this was part of the problem that my colleague had. She didn't know who she was. She was sprinting most of her life, and she missed the fact that she needed to take care of herself. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I've been outside. I've been outside pulling weeds, so <clears throat> a little pollen in my throat. <clears throat> yeah, so you need to create yourself. You need to understand who you are. Uh, influences on personal development, uh, understand the client's personal beliefs. This will be influenced by different aspects of the client, um, and nobody knows uh, how strong and how uh, inclusive uh, uh, culture is uh, than somebody who lives on the, on the Navajo Nation. Uh, the client's culture, how closely do they adhere to the culture in which they grew up? And this is a, a question that if, if you are counseling on the uh, on the Navajo Nation, um, practically everybody you're going to come in contact with uh, will be uh, Diné, but uh, at the same time, <clears throat> they may not adhere to uh, traditionalism very much. As a matter of fact, they may not they might might not even know about some of the traditions that that uh, you think they need to follow. Uh, so this is really quite important when you're dealing with a client. You have to come at them from their point of view, not how you would like them to be. If you think you're going to to uh, change your clients uh, so that they reflect you, uh, then uh, you're probably in the wrong game <laughs> because that's not going to happen. The client's race, of course, is very important. How strongly do they identify with their racial structure? If there is more than one race represented, which is the most important, uh, if there is more than one, uh, is the multiracial aspect a factor? And this is something that you need to think about and that, that you need to talk about. Um, I have uh, several friends who are not 100% uh, 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 Diné. Um, I have a friend who is uh, whose uh, mother is... Hopi and her his uh, father is uh, is Navajo. You know which race is the most important to this individual. And he's a male, so um, and his mother's a Hopi, so that means that he can uh, he can do ceremonies uh, with the Hopi people uh, if he has been. Uh, indoctrinated into into their way of thinking but I'm and, and I'm not exactly sure I don't think that he adheres to either to either traditions if I'm not mistaken anyway not important uh, this is just something that you need to think about if somebody has a has a black mother and a white father or a white mother and a black father <clears throat> uh, which race do they identify with uh, you know how does this work um, where are they and uh, how are they treated because of their multiracial situation? A counselor needs to recognize that their own culture might influence the way that they see and interpret their clients. Uh, and, and this is really quite important. People's cultures is, is very important. Just like your culture is important to you, uh, then you cannot uh, assume that just because somebody's white, just because somebody is... Uh, is African American uh, that their culture isn't important and, and that they want to act like some somebody else? That's not the way it works. People identify with their with their own culture, and you need to respect whatever that culture is, no matter what that culture is, no matter how you feel about I don't know uh, about Bilaganas. Um, and, and I know in some of your ceremonies, Bilaganas are referred to as the enemy, uh, but if you think if you're counseling somebody who's white and you keep thinking of them as the enemy, then you're probably not going to do a very good job of counseling. So you need to accept people for who they are and allow them to uh, adhere to their own culture. A counselor needs to recognize that their racial background might influence the way that they see others, especially if those others 
are from another race. And this is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, first of all, you need to understand their race. You need to understand their culture. You need to not just understand it, but you also need to respect it. Uh, so it really doesn't matter who they are. It does, really doesn't matter what their race is. You need to embrace uh, their their being as as uh, as acceptable if you don't. And this has been a problem in the United States for an extended length of time, uh, where uh, the uh, uh, culture in the United States was dominated by uh, the white culture. Um, being black was was uh, was kind of negative. And this is one of the reasons, and of course you don't remember this because you're too young, uh, but if you were alive in the 1950s and 1960s, 1970s, there was a Black is Beautiful movement. And uh, that uh, kind of uh, started the, uh, it didn't really start, uh, it uh, brought the civil rights movement into the fore. Uh, black Lives Matter, what does that mean? Why, why do black lives matter? Well, the, the, uh, the reason that, that they're saying things like black lives matter isn't that they're saying black lives matter more than any, any other uh, race. What they're saying is uh, you've been treating us as second-class citizens, but black lives do matter. We are equal. That's, the, that's what the Constitution says. And that's all the black lives matter means. Uh, so the black is beautiful movement back in the 1960s. Uh, the Black uh, Black Lives Matter movement now, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, African Americans have been treated as as uh, well. They were slaves uh, until 1865. Uh, I mean, it's it's been an ugly history, uh, and it's the same way with uh, with the indigenous populations in the United States uh, and and around the world. Uh, indigenous populations have been treated as heathens, as as uh, as as a neg as a negative aspect, <clears throat> so one of the things that you need to do is you need to make sure that you don't have these mindsets as well. If you hate all uh, African Americans, then you're in the wrong you're in the wrong job. Uh, if you don't if you hate Mexicans, then you need to uh, you probably need to find something else to do. Uh, as a counselor, you need to help everybody that comes along. Everybody that comes in your door, no matter what they look like, no matter who they are, no matter how they speak, even if your ceremonies call them the enemy, you need to uh, you you need to accept them for who they are. Okay, I'll stop preaching now. Uh, counselor needs to come to grips with their own ethnicity and how that influences uh, who they are and how they see others. This was a really serious problem back in the 60s and 70s. It was accepted uh, almost all the social workers in the South were white, and a lot of their clients were black. And because of the uh, racial prejudices of the time, uh, because of the, the social mindset of the time, and especially in the South, uh, where African Americans weren't allowed to, to vote, uh, they weren't allowed to hold select jobs, uh, they were treated as second and third class citizens, uh, because of that, <clears throat> the they didn't do a very good job, and of course we needed to change all of this, and and it changed in the 60s and 70s. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened, and this is this is a horrible horrible thing, uh, but in the 1970s, uh, social workers started to come onto the reservations, and they were identifying families as uh, inadequate, uh, so they were fostering. Uh, children off the reservation onto uh, uh, off the res they were fostering them off the reservation. So all these uh, uh, these native kids uh, they started off uh, on the reservations and then they were sent to, to families white families off the reservation. Of course later they they changed that law but I you know this is this whole idea that ooh this is this is not the way things are supposed to be because of of who you are you know you got to throw that out the window uh, you need to understand who you are and how you see other people uh, if uh, if you dislike I don't know if you uh, dislike all Pueblo people uh, because they're you know they're not very good Indians 
uh, then yeah, that's the wrong attitude to have. Uh, or if you see uh, uh, your your group of individuals, if you see the Navajo as superior to all other uh, indigenous people, you know that's not the right attitude to have because you're going to be dealing with people from other places, uh, uh, from other tribes. Uh, you're also going to be dealing with uh, Hispanic uh, people. You're going to be dealing with African Americans. You're going to be dealing with uh, with uh, Caucasians. And you need to accept everybody for who they are. And that's not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, one of the things that you need to do is learn about other groups. Self-understanding is an essential step in understanding your clients. There are multiple influences on how you see yourself and interpret the world around you. Your culture, race, and ethnicity are important. Your gender and sexual orientation are influential. Your socioeconomic status, spirituality and religion, life stage, family of origin and disability or ability are influential. The level of stress demands on your life uh, is important as well. And all these things uh, create who you are. Multiple, uh, multicultural competence is a significant predictor of satisfaction in counseling. Difficulties may arise from acknowledged, uh, unacknowledged uh, differences in perception. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> an interesting problem. Um, once upon a time, I was working in uh, Omaha. I was living in Omaha. We were stationed, my wife was stationed there. I was stationed there. What are we talking about? That's where I got out of the service. Anyway, so I, I was, uh, that's when I was teaching. No, I was in the hospital. I was working uh, as a lab tech in the hospital, and uh, they had a spate of suicides in one of the Catholic high schools in Omaha. And Omaha is about 80% Catholic. Uh, so there's public schools, but there's also a lot of uh, parochial schools, a lot of Catholic schools. Um, so uh, here I am chuckling. Uh, they had a spate of suicides in one of the uh, Catholic high schools. Uh, so they decided, uh, and, and it was kind of frightening, and it, be, it, it uh, gained national attention. Uh, so the American, Psychological, uh, American Psychiatric Association decided that they were going to do something about it. So they put together a task force from the East Coast to come out, out to Omaha. And you know where Omaha is, is uh, well, it's, east of, it's west of me, it's north of you. It's almost directly north of where you guys are. Um, so... Yeah, they, they brought a task force out. Well, I don't know if you know understand what Nebraska is. It's all farm country. Uh, it's, it's fairly rural. Uh, Omaha, of course, is fairly uh, urban, but um, a lot of these kids were farm kids. So the, the uh, task force came out from, and most of them were from New York City. New York City and Boston. A lot of them were Jewish. Uh, and here they are, they're coming to a, a Catholic high school in uh, in uh, rural uh, Nebraska, and they're they they want to counsel these kids. Well, they didn't understand they didn't understand rural. They didn't understand Catholic. They didn't understand a lot of stuff. They thought, you know, I I'm from New York City. This is the land. This is the city of diversity. Or I'm from Boston. You know, everybody's different in Boston. Well, they had never really come in contact with that type of mindset. And so uh, they had a lot of problems um, and the suicides, uh, but the suicide stopped. And the reason the suicide stopped, well, it they, they probably played itself out anyway, but it was, it was mostly copycat suicides. But um, the other thing was that the, the community rallied to get rid of these guys from the East Coast who were talking about things that they, that, uh, that they didn't understand. It was, it was a mistake. It was a mistake for the American Psychiatric Association uh, to send people from the East Coast, these urban uh, counselors out to the uh, East Coast, uh, to counsel rural kids. Uh, they, it was wrong for them to send Jewish uh, people with a Jewish mindset uh, to uh, rural Nebraska in order to, uh, to counsel uh, kids that weren't, uh, didn't have a Jewish mindset. Um, it was it was just a, a goat rope. The whole thing was a goat rope. It was a mess, and of course, it stopped the suicides because the 
the community got together and they uh, they got they got together and they they convinced the uh, the task force that they needed to leave that they were causing more harm than good. Anyway, okay. So difficulties may arise from unacknowledged differences in perception. And of course, that was the, the whole urban rural thing. Uh, the assumption is, and I don't know if you've ever been around people from the East Coast, a lot of people from the East Coast think that uh, if <clears throat> if that farm kid from, uh, from Indiana uh, ever came East, he would want to become just like them. That this, that they are the epitome of, of civilization. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it goes in steps. So the, uh, the urban people from New York City are, are, the, are on the highest uh, uh, precipice. And everybody, every, not the precipice, but uh, highest pinnacle. And uh, they need to, uh, and everybody else wants to be just like them. All you need to do is, uh, is see it. How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? That's, a, that's an old song. Uh, anyway, that's the way they, they feel. And that's not really true at all. It would be the same. It would be, be the same uh, for me to assume that because you're uh, Diné, uh, that you, you want to, uh, to, to learn how to be a Western person. Uh, because being Western is the best thing in the whole wide world. Uh, and of course, that's that's ludicrous. Not the rapper. Uh, that's the word. It is critical to examine beliefs, assumptions, and biases. Uh, you need to understand where they're coming from. Uh, it is equally important to understand a culture's influence on clients. How much? Uh, and we talk about this all the time. This is really, really, really important uh, when you're dealing with uh, people on the Navajo Nation. <clears throat> because uh, if, if you think that you're going to uh, convince everybody to become traditional and, and go see a healer, uh, that's not the way it works. You've got a lot of uh, people that are fairly uh, religious, that are Christian uh, on the reservation. Uh, you have people who are Mormon. You have people that are Protestant. You have people, I don't know the Catholic, how strong the Catholic Church is, uh, but you have people that, that uh, aren't traditional at all. And uh, so that's going to be a tough one. That's going to be a tough sell if you think that <clears throat> your job is to make people more Navajo. It's just not going to work that way. Uh, I used to work on the uh, Fort Belknap Reservation up in uh, Montana. <clears throat> it's an interesting place. There are two tribes there, the Assiniboine and the Grovan. Um, it's very Catholic, uh, but it's also very tradi relatively traditional. But there's an evangelical Christian group, the Log Church, uh, and these guys are really adamant uh, that uh, doing anything Indian is heathen. It's, uh, it's blasphemy. Uh, so these people are really kind of funny. They're just, I, I, I say they're funny. They're really negative about their own culture, and uh, to the extent that if they have a name, that is an Indian name, and there's, you know, everybody's got their own names. Stiff Arm talks different. Uh, Doni's a big name. Uh, work is a big name. It's a German name, but uh, W-E-R-K, not W-O-R-K. Uh, there's works, and, and there's just a ton of people. Uh, but if you have a name that is considered Indian, then they don't capitalize it. So if your name was Doni, uh, and you were one of these evangelical Christians, then you would not capitalize the D in Doni. As strange as that may seem. So you, when you're talking to somebody from that reservation, uh, you, you need to figure out whether they're one of these log church people. <clears throat> because if they are, they've got a mindset that is completely alien to, to everything else. They don't go to powwows. Uh, they don't go to any ceremonies. Really fascinating, uh, the, the dichotomy uh, that, that is taking place. Plus, you've got the two different tribes. Uh, but they've been able to get around that. I mean, they've been, <laughs> they've been on the same reservation uh, for, what, 150 years, almost 150 years. So they've learned to live together. But uh, it's, it's other influences that are just strange, strangely tearing things apart. Uh, we read about other races and cultures. How do we learn about other cultures? We read about them. 
uh, this is going to give you some some good background information. Uh, what was uh, it was I was uh, I was at a uh, convoc the convocation. Uh, Dr. Russell was talking about uh, the fact that he was embarrassed because he had uh, um, watched all the Dark Wind uh, episodes. Dark Wind is a uh, uh, is from the Tony Hillerman books, and of course people complain about Hillerman that he got everything wrong. Uh, but the reality is, of course, you know, they got a lot of things right as well. Uh, but, it, I mean, if you take Hillerman as the gospel, uh, Hiller, Hillerman's uh, interpretation of what it is to be a Navajo, uh, then you're, you're probably going to be a, a little bit off base. Uh, you might be a lot off base, depending on, on uh, some of the things that Hillerman talks about. Anyway, so you need to read about it. Uh, it's a good thing, and, and I've... I'm still reading about uh, about the Diné people. Uh, I've been uh, on on uh, your reservation for for seven years. I've been teaching on your reservation for seven years, and I have a lot of books here that uh, deal with uh, uh, that deal with the Navajo people. I just read a book over the summer, uh, Left Hand, uh, Son of uh, Old Man Hat. I, I read that. That was really fascinating. I read Lafarge, uh, Laughing Boy. Um, I've read uh, Navajo Wars. I've got Navajo History here by Acri. Uh, Navajos Wear Nikes by uh, Crystalic. Anyway, I've read a lot. I've got uh, a book about Canyon Duché. I use them as references a lot. Uh, does that mean I understand? Uh, what it's like to be a, a Diné person? No, but it, I have an idea. <clears throat> I'm not yelling at you. <laughs> I'm clear, actually clearing my throat. Sorry. Uh, we recognize the strengths and weaknesses of uh, dominant and minority racial groups. Uh, when I say dominant uh, racial groups, I'm talking about ones that are, seem to be in charge. Uh, if we look at uh, the American, co the uh, U.S. Congress. Uh, most of those people are, are white, and most of them are, are lawyers. There's a lot of lawyers in there. Unfortunately, there's some businessmen, and they just kind of kind of screw things up. We de uh, by developing uh, meaningful relationships with people from various racial and cultural groups, we can gain a different perspective on all people, and this is really important. Uh, if we only hang around with people that are like us, uh, then we really don't understand other people. As a matter of fact, it may scare us when this person comes into our office to, to be counseled because we don't understand them. And we, we have these strange stereotypes about, uh, about potentially about African Americans, about Apaches, about, uh, uh, about Hopis, uh, uh, about uh, Mexican Americans. Uh, about white people. All white people are greedy, you know, these stereotypes. Uh, black males are dangerous. Uh, it seems to be uh, a mindset of the United States uh, law enforcement uh, agencies since they keep shooting black men who are unarmed. By developing relationships with the colleagues and mentors who are willing to discuss cultural and racial issues, this is a, a good way to uh, to learn about other about other cultures. When I was in college, when I was an undergraduate back in the late '60s and early '70s, um, I uh, my dormitory uh, was had all the African Americans were in my dormitory uh, because there were a lot of uh, uh, fraternities on my campus, and the fraternities were all segregated. So uh, if you were African American and you came to my college, then you had to live in the dormitory. And, uh, you know, you might think, oh, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. But the reality is, it was kind of cool because um, I learned about civil rights. Uh, you know, I, I had only, um, I hadn't really grown up uh, with African Americans. I had uh, interacted with them to some extent, but, but not to a major extent. And here I was, I was living with them. So uh, lots of really great conversations. We became wonderful friends. Wonderful lifelong friends. Uh, so, uh, developing relationships with these individuals is really important. I miss all my black friends. It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> when I'm up here around 
almost all white people. <laughs> I miss being on the reservation. It's just so bizarre. Um, I was living in Oklahoma, and then uh, my wife was, uh, uh, she was stationed in Korea, and then she, it was an isolated tour. And when she came back, she, uh, uh, we went to Japan. And so when, when I was in Japan, I missed the, I missed people from Oklahoma, which are, there's a lot of American Indians in Oklahoma. I miss them so much. It was weird. <laughs> I always miss the people I'm not around. It's kind of strange. Anyway, and I miss you guys. I, I wish I were, I could uh, uh, be, be with you, uh, despite the fact that I just love Iowa. It's nice and green. Uh, when I say nice and green, I live in a cornfield, so. Uh, and uh, I've got a soybeans field to my uh, south, and I've got a uh, cornfield to my north. So we're surrounded by green, and of course the grass is green. I just mowed it yesterday. Uh, it's uh, pretty heavy green stuff. Watching films about other races, good idea. Uh, participating in cultural activities or visiting other countries, that's, that's a, also a good idea. This is uh, some kind of a Hindu thing. Yeah, the Hindu something or other. So it's right there, Hindu. So this is a Hindu ceremony. Oops. Culture has a strong influence on the roles that many people see as appropriate. Proper behavior of children toward parents. Level of independence and autonomy of, of children. Patterns of communication between parents and children family boundaries and responsibilities, and how you express your emotions. Cultural values can influence feelings about work. Can, it can influence feelings about education. How do you feel about education? It can influence feelings about health care. Cultural values can influence feelings about religion. Lots of religions out there. Lots of different ways of seeing spirituality. Cultural values can influence feelings about family structure and responsibilities. In many Asian societies, adult children are expected to provide shelter and care for their elderly parents. In some cultures, parents and other older family members expect to be involved in decisions concerning marriage and money spent by adult children. When dealing with newly arrived immigrants, language skills may be sparse, and local dialects may not be understood. The children of new immigrants may feel torn between their native culture and the new culture. Often people of different races or cultures have different expectations of their practitioner and the counseling process. Researchers have discovered that Asian clients value insight and personal growth but they tend to prefer expert guidance, advice, explicit instructions, structured problem-focused suggestions. So if you have a client who is uh, from Asia, potentially is Chinese or Japanese or, or, uh, or South Korean, uh, they may expect you to just give them advice. They don't want to talk. They don't want to tell you what the problem is. They will answer all your questions, but they exp expect all this information uh, as soon as they come in the door, it is—it's uh, really kind of, kind of fascinating. And if you, <clears throat> uh, if you don't give them advice, and and if you don't um, explain your expertise, uh, then they'll leave. They they won't will not stay with you. So you need uh, you need a more directive approach if you're dealing with uh, somebody from uh, who is Chinese. Japanese or South Korean. When dealing with American Indians, the council has to gauge how traditional the individual is as to determine proper, appropriate, uh, and timing of eye contact, how directly to come to a point in a conversation, personal space, and facial expressions. Uh, I had a, uh, a healer that, that I, uh, let's see, how can I explain this? Uh, he invited me to, to sweat with him, and uh, he thought it was important. He was kind of an interesting guy. Uh, he ran a sweat uh, in, uh, in uh, Montana. He, he ran a sweat, and he used it for healing, 
and he said that in order uh, in order for the sweat to be powerful, in order for the sweat to be properly um, arranged, uh, there had to be uh, somebody there uh, who was white. Uh, he said that uh, ignoring, pretending, pretending that uh, American Indians can do things by themselves has has been a mistake ever since the Europeans arrived. <laughs> <laughs> and he said that uh, in order for his healing to work, and, and he, uh, he got his healing power uh, from fasting up on a mountain. Uh, he was uh, the worst alcoholic you can possibly imagine. Uh, went up on the mountain. He fasted for like five or six days. Um, and when he came down, he was sober, and he didn't take a drink after that. Um uh, it was it was kind of amazing because he had been an alcoholic for uh, 35 40 years uh and uh he was really kind of a, kind of an interesting guy but uh, he said you know all these other people they have sweats and they won't let white people in he said but uh what by bringing white people in it uh, uh it, it strengthens my resolve it, it it keeps me from saying bad things about people uh which was kind of interesting. Anyway, he and I were pretty good friends. But if we ever had a conversation, oh, it was like this. It's like, it was like uh, walking up a, a mountain on the outside and having to make all these concentric circles uh, because he would tell you the same thing three or four times. Really kind of fascinating. Anyway, so how, how directly uh, do you come to the point? Uh, with, uh, with Sonny, it was... Uh, it was after about two hours. Anyway, how much personal space do they need? Uh, do, do individuals need? And of course, uh, what facial expressions are acceptable and, and unacceptable? Uh, the dominant culture in the United States, the dominant culture is a white culture. As at this point, anyway, uh, it looks like uh, white white people aren't reproducing as rapidly as other individuals. Immigrants are coming into the United States that aren't white. Um, and uh, it looks like the white population is not going to be the dominant uh, uh, culture for forever. Uh, maybe within the next 25 or 50 years, um, the uh, it, things will change. Because of the dominance of the, of the uh, culture, whites tend to be uh, given institutional benefits per, uh, referred to as white privilege. A lot of people don't agree with this. A lot of conservative people don't agree with this, but uh, if you have your eyes open, then it's very fairly easy to see. Whites often do not recognize that they are privileged because it is the norm. Just like attractive people don't recognize that they are privileged, tall people don't recognize that they are privileged, athletes don't uh, recognize that they are privileged. Um, when I was in college, I got in trouble my freshman year. I got in trouble like within the first three weeks. And this had to do with traditionalism. Um, I, I did something that I, I, I didn't sing the school song correctly. And uh, I was supposed to get my head shaved in the shape of a W. Well, there were five of us that, uh, well, actually there were seven of us that didn't sing the school so the song correctly. One, one kid left right away. He just left school. He said, you know, if you're going to be this stupid, I'm leaving. Um, there was one guy that allowed his head to be shaved in the shape of a W. As you can imagine how embarrassing that is, walking around with a W on your head. Um, and the other five of us refused to have the haircut. So we were all uh, socially ostracized. Uh, but I was running cross-country. Uh, and during the track season, I broke, I broke a school record my freshman year. Uh, so uh, of the five of us, um, two people left uh, after their freshman year, and the other two individuals didn't make it to, to graduation. I was the only one of the five, the, uh, these five ostracized individuals who didn't make it, who, who graduated. I was the only one. But the reality is, the reason I was able to do that is because I was an athlete. And uh, I mean, you can you can you can tell an athlete that he's uh, he's a bad person, but uh, there's it's a privileged position. Uh, so while they were 
being negative to the other individuals, they, they weren't nearly as negative to me uh, as they were to everybody else. So athletes are privileged. Tall people are considered superior. They're considered leaders. Attractive people, of course, get away with murder on a continual basis if you're an ugly guy. And we'll, we talk about that in cultural psych psychology, how attractive criminals uh, get a lesser sentence. Um, attractive females rarely go to prison, you know, that kind of stuff. Women, women and men are different. Uh, they respond differently to the same stimuli and therefore must be approached differently in therapy. Research shows that the, the male and female brain are different. They're structured different. They're structured different from the very beginning. Uh, the male brain is bathed in testosterone uh, so that he will become um, an individual that, that reproduces or wants to reproduce. And uh, this, is, this is what has to happen in order for the species to, uh, to continue, is that uh, the male has to... Uh, have this desire to reproduce. And of course, the female has a desire to reproduce as well. Uh, but it's, it's different. It's just, it's a totally different structure. Sex is based on genitals. Uh, men are born with penises. Women are born with vaginas. Uh, but the difference in brain structure begins about uh, after about the uh, sixth week. At that point, the male fetal brain is bathed in testosterone. As I said before, female brain is not. But sex isn't always the final word on gender. Gender is the social assignments of how males and females are supposed to act. Behavior is often based on gender stereotypes. Girls are meter maids, boys are policemen. Boys are doctors, girls are nurses. Gender stereotypes prescribe how a person should respond to life. Unfortunately, social construction of gender continues throughout our lives. Gender bias uh, comes through the use of unexplained, uh, unexamined stereotypes. The good counselor will ignore stereotypes and allow their clients to express feelings freely, um, both males and females. Some people do not agree with the sex that they are assigned by genetics. Uh, these individuals are referred to as transgender. If they have sex reassignment surgery, they become transsexual. And this is a young lady. Uh, who felt more like a guy, and that is what she eventually became. Maybe it's the other way around. I don't remember. This is a transsexual. He's, look at it. Yeah, the chin's too wide. Yeah, they, this is what he he looked like before. This is what she looked like after her her surgery. Transgender and tan transsexualism has nothing to do with sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is the direction or directions of one's sexual affectionate or loving attention. Embedded in sexual orientation are societal beliefs, stereotypes, and views about sexual expression. Coming out for homosexuals is complicated, but has been made easier by the legalization of homosexual unions. Practitioners are not immune to heterosexism. In other words, thinking that every everybody that looks like a female has to be uh, has to be a a uh, female, and everybody that looks like a male has to be a male. Uh, socioeconomic status refers to uh, standards and measurements of economic wealth and structures. Socioeconomic status is especially efficacious in capitalist economies where wealth dictates your position in society, and this has been going on. Uh, since capitalism was first invented. Socioeconomic status is based on several measurements, your income, your occupation, and your education level. So socioeconomic status influences many aspects of your life. Quality of health care, obesity is, is tied to socioeconomic status, uh, educational possibilities, neighborhoods that uh, you can afford, and child care. And these are uh, this is Warren Buffett, and this is Bill Gates, two richest men in the United States. It is important for practitioners to understand the invisible but powerful impact of socioeconomic status. The higher the socioeconomic status, the more likely a practitioner will assume success for their client. 
For many clients, spiritual and religious beliefs and training are key to their existence. A wise practitioner will not question a client's spiritual or religious training. Religion involves communal behaviors. Spirituality can be understood as an individual's relationship to God or any ultimate power. And these are uh, these are Muslims. They are Shia, uh, and uh, on the day that um, and I can't think of who their their martyr was, but uh, the, the the individual that came up with with the whole Shia religion. Uh, he was martyred on a select day, and on that day, they walk through the streets flagellating themselves and bleeding. The more they bleed, uh, the more they are in tune with their martyr. As you can see, he's hitting himself with these things. I'm not sure if they have sharp edges, but he's certainly bleeding. Some religions are totalitarian in nature or don't accept any other religious concept as legitimate but their own. Other religions are pluralist in nature and accept many practices as legitimate. And we can get into this if you like. Uh, we can argue about this. Uh, Muslim religion, the Christian religion, uh, this is Greek Orthodox. This is the Orthodox religion. This guy's Jewish and this guy is a Mullah, he's a, uh, uh, a Muslim uh, cleric. A practitioner must be aware that their own spirituality or religion might taint their view of a client. A practitioner must accept a client within their client's religious context, no matter what that context is. As we age, we change going from an infant to a toddler, to a child, to an adolescent, a young adult, and, and then declining as an adult until we are no longer functional and we die. Life stages are influenced by our biological development. Eric Erickson identified eight life stages that occur in everyone's life tied to a psychological crisis that must take place for the individual to develop normally psychologically. The first stage is hope. Uh, it is uh, that, uh, that of an infant and runs from birth to the second year. Uh, the trust that must be resolved in the first two years is trust versus mistrust. Will the caregiver be there when the infant needs food, succor, or a change of clothing? Should I trust this adult? Hope is what uh, the first stage is. The second stage is will, begins with potty training somewhere in the second year and runs until the child is completely potty trained. The crisis involved in the second stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. The third life stage is purpose. It runs until the child starts school at age five. The crisis that the preschooler goes through is initiative versus guilt. Has the child been allowed to express their desire to discover the world on their own? If they have, then they will develop initiative. The fourth life stage, competence, uh, involves going to school and developing a whole new social interaction. The fourth crisis is industry versus inferiority. Will the child strive to compete on an equal level with their peers? And if you think about, I don't know if you remember being in the first grade, uh, but all through your, your school years, you are constantly being compared to all of the other people in the class. Potentially, your teacher uh, uh, curved their grades. Uh, so maybe your grade, maybe you were the smartest person in the class and everybody hated you because you were the one that messed up the curve. If you uh, didn't get such a high grade, then they could, uh, they could, uh, uh, they could still pass with a, with a really low grade. And so you didn't get it, and you were the one that really messed up the curve. Anyway, uh, industry versus inferiority. The fifth life stage, fidelity, uh, encompasses uh, adolescence and all the problems fraught uh, from that transition. Uh, the crisis that Erickson identified at this point in life was identity versus role confusion. Who will I be as an adult? And, of course, this is we're trying out different... Uh, uh, identities throughout high school, uh, throughout our adolescent years. Uh, do we want to be a thug? Uh, do we want to be a brainiac? Uh, do we want to be an athlete? Uh, who are we going to be? 
Uh, the sixth life stage, love, occurs as a young adult. Uh, the crisis that Erickson identified at this point in life was intimacy versus isolation. Will I pair bond and have children, or will I remain alone? The seventh life stage, care, involves getting older and runs through the heart of the individual's working years to retirement. The crisis involved is generativity versus stagnation. Will I try to pass on my knowledge, or will I keep it to myself? <clears throat> the last life stage, wisdom, deals with an individual's declining years and ends with death. The crisis the individual faces at this stage in life involves a life well-lived or a life wasted, and the crisis is integrity versus despair. If I can look back on my life and say, hey, look at all these people I helped, then I have integrity. If I look back and say, geez, I was a real jerk, wasn't I? Then I'll look back with despair. Different rates of physical development and social pressures influence life stage decisions. Some people may go through the life stages quickly because they are forced to support their family at an early age. Others may delay getting into adulthood because life situations have not forced them through identity versus identity confusion. And this is one of the things that happened during the Vietnam War. Uh, people were graduating from high school. My brother graduated from high school in uh, June. In July, he turned 18. Uh, and at the end of July, he was in the Army. Uh, he didn't volunteer. <laughs> he was drafted. His draft number, as it turned out, was 1. My draft number was 72. So I was able to, to wait a little bit. Actually, I was I had a, a 2S deferment. Uh, anyway, so, wow. Uh, here he was. Uh, he was a 17-year-old kid uh, in June. He was an 18-year-old man in, uh, in July. And by the end of the month, he was in the Army. Uh, and by November, he was in Vietnam. So here he was, an 18-year-old, and he was, uh, he was fighting against uh, the communists in Vietnam. Uh, identity versus identity confusion. This is, if you ever watch a movie written and directed by Seth Rogen, uh, a lot of his characters are lost. They are, they are kids. They don't grow up. Um, and that seems to be the uh, uh, problem with, with, uh, with his characters. This may be one of the reasons, I mean, J this is James Franco's life. Uh, this guy was seducing his, his college students. He was teaching a graduate class, and he was seducing his students. You know, that's, that's a real teenage, goofy guy thing to do, is try to seduce your, your students. Uh, you know, that's some kind of... A, an odd 13-year-old fantasy that people have. Um, but uh, James Franco lived that life, and now, of course, he's paying for it. I think he is. People won't hire him anymore. Oddly, during adolescence, everyone wants to fit in, but adulthood means establishing your own identity. And this is kind of a, this is where the flip-flop comes. This is when you, you need to decide uh, that, uh, that, uh, in order for me to be a successful adult, I need to 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 uh, jettison my friends. These individuals that that want to to act like uh, teenage boys or teenagers all their lives, uh, act like you know goofy girls or whatever, uh, because that's what you are in, in junior high school. You just want to fit in, in in junior high, in in high school. But when you become an adult, you've got to break away from that whole mode and you create your own family, you need to go to work, you need to get away from that that party dude, you know, idea, that stupid idea. Some people never do. Some people want to, to stay in that mode the rest of their lives. And that's what happens. That is what happened with Seth Rogen's crowd. And unfortunately, James Franco is one of those individuals. Practitioners help clients deal with challenges of life stages. <clears throat> Not everyone passes through or is allowed to pass through the life stages at the same rate. Some people are assisted through the life stages. And I'm not sure why. Oh, that's the practitioner. And I, I apologize for all the naked people. Um, this was, uh, uh, I had my first girlfriend when I was a junior in high school. 
And the first thing she said to me is, uh, I wasn't her first boyfriend. Uh, she said, you have to go beat up my old boyfriend. And I, I didn't quite understand. I never did it. Uh, and for that reason, I don't think she really liked me that much uh, because I wouldn't fight for her. And uh, I'm not sure why I needed to, uh, to hit him or to fight him. He was from another town. I don't know. I, you know, that that's really confusing. This idea that you have to, that you have to beat up the old boyfriend in order to be the uh, unacceptable current boyfriend. But that's what she thought. Family influences our worldview. Uh, what we are told as children will temper the way that we deal with uh, people outside the family all of our lives. Uh, even the concept of family may be skewed by those uh, that we grow up with. Understanding how we have been affected by our own family helps us recognize these experiences as personal and not assume the same meanings and experiences are true for others. One person may have had uh, no support from their parents. Another individual might recognize cousins or anyone similar as brothers and sisters. And this is really kind of interesting because here I am, I'm 72 years old. Um, one of my cousins has just died and her children... Um, we didn't really know them very well. They stayed, pretty much stayed where they were. Uh, and the reason is because they were very religious people. They were Lutherans, but they were uh, Wisconsin centered. And if you don't understand Lutherans, don't worry about it. <laughs> there are different synods. Um, there's the Illinois Synod and the American Synod and the Wisconsin Synod, synod uh, and the Missouri Synod. And one of them is tends to be a, a more uh, uh, fundamental than the others. And they were Wisconsin Synod. And because they were Wisconsin Synod and we didn't go to church, then they wouldn't come and visit us. Well, okay, so that was that's for the last 50 years, we haven't ever seen these people. But uh, then the uh, patri the matriarch of the family died, my cousin, uh, Sally, Sally died. Uh, real jolly lady when she, you were around her, but of course she didn't want to be around you very much because she was afraid you would influence her children. Uh, so finally she died, and now her children, my second cousins, are going, we don't really know you, and you guys seem like really nice people. So uh, the 17th of September, we're going to have a family reunion with that family. Uh, so my family uh, is, is going to, I have to drive all the way to Indiana to to be around these people. They uh, they miss their mother, I guess. They're grieving, of course. Uh, so uh, it's going to, it should be interesting. We're going to finally meet our second cousins and and, uh, and uh, realize they're going to realize that we we don't have tails and, and horns and whatnot. We're not the devil. Maybe I hope so. <laughs> anyway, we'll see what happens. Should be interesting. I'll give I'll give you a lowdown once uh, once it happens. Uh, there are a number of groups of people who are referred to as family amongst the traditional Diné uh, clans. Dictate family and extended relationships. This is uh, I, I spelled it this this way because it was in the uh, it was in the uh, text. Uh, this is the way Hillerman spells Dene, so, uh, but of course you spell it with a, an accent mark rather than the H. Developmental stages for families are influenced by culture, religious, and spiritual beliefs, socioeconomic status, etc. As families develop in time, changes in any of these statuses can cause changes in the family dynamic. Family has changed in recent decades. Divorce was once a social stigma. But now many people have uh, multiple marriages and thus multiple families. Blended families have become the norm, and of course that was the Brady Bunch. Uh, the Brady Bunch didn't sell, tell people to uh, get uh, to divorce and get married. Um, they actually didn't talk about what happened to the spouses of uh, Marcia, not Marcia, what was her name? Carol. Carol, and I can't remember his name either. Uh, anyway, they... They, he had all the boys and she had all the girls and all the girls were blonde and all the boys had, had black hair and these were his kids and those were her, her girls uh, and they blended together. That was the Brady Bunch. 
Uh, when I was in grade school, elementary school, there was one divorced family in my elementary school. Uh, and, if, and that seems amazing if you, if you think about it. But this was in the 50s, and, and divorce was illegal in most states. So in order to get a divorce, you had to go to Nevada in order to get a divorce, or Mexico in order to divorce your spouse. Uh, so yeah, that was rare. So one of my best friends, is, his dad was divorced and remarried. <clears throat> I've been divorced uh, twice and uh, remarried twice, of course. Uh, disabilities are a fact of life. With every ability we tout, there are those, including us, who may lack that ability. Uh, I can remember lots of things, but I have a hard time remembering the lyrics to songs. It's certainly not a disability, but uh, it has gotten me in trouble before. As I told you, I didn't sing the school song correctly. I had five errors, and uh, it was a lot of words, and I, I memorized almost all of them, but I missed five, and so they were going to Shave my head in the shape of a W. Disabilities come in all shapes and sizes. Some make life a struggle, while others, like my lyrics phobia, uh, have very little impact at all. Uh, it is estimated that 20% of the people in the United States will experience a serious disability in their lifetime, and that does not include lyrics. Now, it, it, this is the amazing thing is that my daughter can hear a song once, and she remembers every single word and the inflections in those words. Her son is exactly the same way. My grandson has memorized all the songs on alternative mu music channel on Sirius. Uh, just amazing. He knows all the words, even the bad words. Uh, and uh, usually when the bad words comes up, he doesn't sing them. He just goes, ha, 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 ha. Uh, it's kind of funny. Developmental disabilities are severe and chronic. Uh, they are due to mental or physical impairment. They manifest themselves before the age of 22. They are likely to continue indefinitely. They result in substantial functional limitations. They represent services and support for survival. And these are developmental disabilities such as autism, um, uh, intellectual deficits, uh, that's uh, that's what we're talking about. The past in the past, many people with disabilities were isolated from the mainstream community. However, through legislation, people with disabilities are now afforded the opportunity to live lives as close to that of a non-disabled person as possible. Uh, interesting situation. I was uh, I, I started working at Ashford in 2011. And one of the people that was in my orientation had a disability. He was paralyzed on, on the left side. He was able to function. Uh, he was able to walk, but he walked with, with a fairly severe limp. Uh, but he didn't use a walker. He didn't use a cane. He, uh, he just walked. And I didn't realize he had a disability. Um, but half of his face was, was paralyzed. His right arm barely worked. Uh, I think it was his right side that was paralyzed. Anyway... Um, I didn't even notice it for like the first three or four days that we were, were there, uh, or that uh, we were being oriented together. We ate lunch together. Uh, we, we walked down to the cafeteria together. And, you know, I, I didn't even notice it. I guess then not very observant. Anyway, not important. There are legal protections for those with disabilities. Americans with Disabilities Act, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the Civil Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, Rehabilitation Act, Affordable Health Care Choice, Health Choices Act. Language is important when dealing with people with a disability. Words used in the past may have taken on stronger and stronger stigmas. Therefore, being politically correct when dealing with disabilities makes the stigma less intrusive. Um, oh, the uh, incorrect forms, uh, we don't say mailman anymore, we don't say midget and dwarf, we don't say blind, we don't say fat, we don't say crippled. Uh, the correct f uh, term for a, a person that carries your mail is a mail carrier. Uh, the correct term for someone who is... Uh, 
was shorter than uh, than is the average is horizontally challenged. Uh, the correct term for someone who can't see is visually challenged. Uh, the correct term for someone who is uh, overweight is either stout or overweight. And instead of using the word crippled, we use we say disabled or physically challenged. A uh, problem that I have is the word skinny. Uh, skinny is a pejorative term. Uh, it's not politically correct. Uh, the word is slender. That should be used as slender. I do this all the time. I correct myself every time I say it. Uh, I will try to be politically correct in this class. Uh, it is important for practitioners to take care of themselves. Uh, they must be aware of possible stressors in their private life that can impact their lives. They must maintain a sense of perspective. Are they living vicariously through their clients? This is a can be a problem. If your client has a problem, all of a sudden you feel like you have a problem too. No, you don't. Your, pro your client has a problem and you need to help them. Don't take on their problems. The practitioner is the instrument of therapy and unless they are cared for and in tune, they will not be able to do their job. Focusing on others and ignoring your own needs can lead to burnout. Burnout is increasing discouragement and emotional and physical exhaustion. Burnout is not uncommon among practitioners. Uh, building a healthy lifestyle is important and must be started immediately. Don't wait until you graduate to get into the groove of a healthy lifestyle. The sooner you start, the more routine it will become. When a practitioner is working with a client, they will sometimes begin experiencing the emotional and physical pain of their clients. This is known as secondary traumatic stress. It is important to work on developing character strengths such as creativity, love of learning, humility, and other qualities. Da, 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 da. And that is the end. If you have any questions, give me a call. Uh, send me an email if it's something that I've forgotten. Uh, I can put it uh, in a, a group uh, uh, email uh, to you all. <clears throat> okay, I'll see you next week.